This is uh, the third, uh, fourth lecture actually addressing the uh, lives of the great scholars who serve this dean. And are focusing this year uh, mainly on the Muhaddithin, scholars who um, spend their entire life serving the Sunnah of the Prophet. Just make it simple for you to uh, remember the important names uh, when it comes to the books, uh, collections uh, of hadith. There are two Sahih and three Sunan. No Sahih al-Bukhari, no Sahih al And there are four Sunan, the Sunan Abu Dawood, and Sunan al-Tirmidhi, Sunan al-Nasai, and Sunan uh, al-Tirmidhi. At Abu Dawood, al-Tirmidhi, al-Nasai, and Ibn Majah. So, Two Sahih al Bukhari and Muslim, and four Sunan Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, Al Tirmidhi, and Al Imam Al Nasa'i. Right, so when they say the books, the six books, we are referring to these two Sahih and four Sunan. Again, Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Dawood, Al Tirmidhi, Al Nasa'i, and Ibn Majah. There's one Abu and one Ibn, Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. Okay? And then Al Nasa'i and Al Tirmidhi. Right? And there's of course uh, Musnad Imam Ahmad. Some want to add this as one of the main references. Musnad and Imam Ahmad. The word Musnad comes from the word Salat or the chain of narration. And of course Muatta Malik and some concern Muatta Malik to be actually more accurate than any of all these books, including Sahih al Bukhari. Because Imam uh, Bukhari actually used uh, Sahih uh, or, or Muatta Imam Malik. And Imam al-Shafi'i said that there is no book more authentic than Muatta Malik. And some consider Muatta Malik to be number one, and then the Bukhari, and then Muslim, and so on. And Imam Abu Dawood, uh, as you may have noticed already, um, uh, came in the golden age, when the time when the Muslims wrote, start writing the hadith, the generation before them, and Imam Malik, and then uh, from the time of Aurum Dabalaj. Aurum Dabalaj died in the year 101, almost 100 years after the Hijrah of the Prophet. And here is the one who ordered the ulama to start collecting the hadith and put it in books. So, uh, Imam, the, 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 the first half, uh, or the uh, second half of the second century and the first half of the third century. This was the time when we have all these big names. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Ishaq ibn Rahawi, uh, Ibn Madini, uh, um, Abu Zara, uh, Razi, um, and then Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, and, and, and so on. We mentioned before Imam Bukhari uh, was one of the students of Imam Ahmad. Similarly, Abu Dawood was also one of the students of Al Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Uh, uh, his name is Abu, uh, his name is Sulaiman ibn Ash'at ibn Ishaq al Azdi. And Azd is a tribe, Yemeni tribe, very ancient Yemeni tribe. They migrated to this uh, part of Sixtan, uh, which is uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, between the east of Iran and the west of Afghanistan. Belushistan, uh, have you heard of Belushistan? Belushistan? Yeah. So near this area, uh, which is part of it today, is in Iran, another part in Afghanistan. It's from this part. And um, as usual, um, these ulama, as we mentioned before, ulama al-hadith in particular, they have to travel extensively, seeking the hadith, meeting with the ulama, meeting the, with individuals who heard the hadith from uh, sound chain of narration to take the hadith directly from them. So if you uh, told me Brother Arif said something, it's different from me hearing it from Brother Arif directly, right? So even if I take it from a trustworthy person, to Brother Arif, it's better and stronger if I take it directly from So they would travel to meet the person, even if he's in a totally different um, uh, place.
He was born in 202 uh, in the, the woods, um, and that was the time of the Abbasids. He was born in the town of Ma'mun, the son of Harun al-Rashid, uh, the uh, great and most famous uh, Khalifa. His son is uh, al Ma'mun, who was ruling at that time. Um, and he traveled to Al-Rayyu and Al-Araf, went to Al-Basra, went to Al-Kufa, and then went to uh, Egypt and uh, Damascus, uh, Mecca and Medina, and um, he also learned from Al-Man Bukhari because he was living in the same time. Remember what year Al-Man Bukhari died? 256. 256, right. So, and he, he now died in 275. So he lived about 20 years after Imam al Bukhari. <coughs> of course, they have a lost list of, of his teacher and so many students. And as we will see also, one of his brilliant students is Imam al Tirmidhi. We'll talk about him, inshallah, perhaps tomorrow or the day after. Um, so, so, when you see a hadith in the end, say, Rawahu Abu Dawood. And sometimes it's like Abu Dawood and Ahmed. Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and al Tirmidhi. Right? So Abu Dawood was uh, a great scholar also of, of Hadith. And Imam uh, Abu Dawood uh, was humbly uh, in Baghdad. Uh, as many scholars actually said that um, he was not just a muhaddith, he was a muhaddith and a great faqih. And he knows the Masail, and especially the Masail of Imam Ahmad. And he wrote a book about Masail and Imam Ahmad. One of the books he wrote about the fatwas and the opinions of Imam Ahmad, and he put it in order of uh, fiqh. He wrote his book with, that we'll talk about today, Sunan Abu Dawood, known as Sunan Abi Dawood. Um, obviously, in he wrote his Sunan in early age, uh, and he actually, when he finished writing his Sunan Abi Dawood, he gave it actually to Imam Ahmad the Hamalish teacher to look at it and to view it. And Imam Ahmad liked it uh, very much. Uh, 4,000 hadith in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this book, and this came out of 500,000 hadith he knows. He only included 4,000 hadith. One of the major differences between Imam uh, Sunan Abu Dawood, Bukhari and Muslim is that we know that Imam Bukhari and Muslim they included only in their Sahih, only the Hadith Sahih, only the Sahih Hadith. As we said, Imam Bukhari out of 600,000, he only included 4,000. But Imam uh, Abu Dawood did not do that. He wrote some Hadith that is Sahih and some of them is Hassan. And some of them he didn't like. But he wrote, when he write the hadith, he said this hadith is died. Because of this person not known, or this person uh, you know, um, you know, not that trustworthy, and so on. So he write why this hadith is uh, not sahih. In the ilm al-hadith is something called the hadith sahih, and then hadith hasan. What is the difference between hasan means good, okay, accept. So Sahih, we talk about the Sahih, the definition of Sahih. And al Hasan is less than the Sahih. In what sense? Remember when we talk about the definition of Hadith Sahih, which means that the, the, the Hadith that's narrated by connected chain of narration from trustworthy and um, accurate person, person whose narration is, has a sharp mind. Adl adopt. The word Adl means trustworthy and adopt. You know what the word adopt is? Adopt. Observe. Observe. Okay. Um, okay. In Arabic, they call the officer Dabit. No. No. Anyway, Dabit means the person who, whose memory is sharp. So if someone was Trustworthy, but his memory is not that sharp, then we call this hadith Hassan. So you have 15 people in this generation, right? All of them are trustworthy. All of them. But one of them, or perhaps two, are known to be people who are get sometimes confused. They mix hadith together. Their memory is not that sharp. Then the hadith goes down 
from Sahih into Hasan. Is this point clear? Or this is the, perhaps one of the main differences between Hadith Sahih and Hadith Hasan. So he included his, in his uh, Sunan Abu Dawood Hadith that is Sahih and Hasan. And Hadith that does not, are not very weak, he also includes them in his, in his book. The second major um, unique thing about his book is that he focused most on the hadith that has to do with fiqh and grooming. And that's why fiqha always look at Sunan Abu Dawood because most of the hadith in this book has to do with Islamic rulings or, or fiqh or hadith related to uh, ahkam shari. Some of his, the third point is that some of his uh, hadith included has to do with hadith mawquf and marfu. Maybe you, have, you will hear this terminology later on. When they say this hadith is marfu, marfu means that the Sahabi said the Prophet said, like Sayyid Abdullah bin Mas'ud, he said, I heard the Prophet saying so and so, or the Prophet told us to do this or not to do that, right? That's, the, that's called marfu. The, the, the hadith connected all the way to the Prophet. But sometimes there is another kind of hadith called mawquf. Mawquf means that the Sahabi says something. He does not say the Prophet said. Okay? He does not say the Prophet said. Like Allah bin Mas'ud said that in the Day of Judgment, Allah will forgive a kind of forgiveness that nobody has ever thought about. Rahmah and forgiveness, Allah will show the day of judgment did not even come across anybody's mind. People will be surprised by the kind of forgiveness of Allah. I don't know if you do this. Anyway, so this Iblis, the same of the Prophet or the same of Allah the does it make a difference? Of course it does. Right? Is it the same of Allah the Mas'ud or the same of Rasulullah? Is this hadith more for or more poor for Abdullah the Mas'ud? Most of the ulama, they look at the hadith and said, most likely Abdullah bin Mas'ud would not say this from his own mind. He must have heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But he must say, Qala Rasulullah He said, not, not, We don't know. We don't know. So the ulama al-hadith, they, you know, the ulama al-hadith is all about categorizing the hadith. We have, you know, tens of different categories. And within the category, we have subcategories. So they have to put the hadith in the right place. And then this hadith is mawquf on Abdullah bin Mas'ud. It's the opinion of Allah Musa. It's the same of Allah Musa. So when the hadith is mawquf, right, the fuqaha also, and related to ahkam halal and haram, well, that does not have that much authority. It is the opinion of Omar or Aisha or Ibn Abbas. That's mawquf. It's not marfu'r. Right? Sometimes the, the ulama, they look at this hadith as mawquf, and they find many other narrations in which another Sahabi said the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So it is more proof in this chain of narration, but it's more full from another way. Right? So they, when they put it together, they say, okay, this hadith is, was narrated as more proof and as more full. So now you know the difference between Sahih and Hassan and more proof and more full. Right? So he included the marfu hadith, most of the hadith, is a hadith to the marfu, it says, all the way to the Prophet and, and also mawquf, a hadith, and also the saying of the Sahab, the clear saying of the Sahab, or the fatwas of the Sahab. All right? So we have a hadith in which Omar said this and that. We call this hadith, by the way, hadith is not only the saying of the Prophet. All right? So, when Omar went to Awak, and told him we should compile the Quran in one book. We'll talk about this yesterday. That's a hadith. What's the hadith? The hadith said Al uh, Omar advised Al Bak Radiallahu to buy the Quran. That's a hadith. Right? For the word hadith means speech or saying. Okay? So technically any report that comes from the Prophet or from the Sahaba, the Allah. We call this also hadith, right? So you'll find plenty of these things in his sunnah. The saying of the Prophet, obviously, and the mawquf hadith, and the opinions of the Sahaba, that Allah and the fatwas are also included in his 
He died in the middle of Shawwal. Now, Imam Muslim died in Rajab. Right? Imam Bukhari died in the last day of Ramadan. Right? Imam Abu Dawood died in the middle of Shawwal of 2075. So how old was he when he died? 72. 73. Huh? 73. Okay, so someone is awake. <laughs> <laughs> so he was born in 202 and died in 275. So he lived for 73 uh, blessed years. Imam the was known as a person who was uh, very strong in the Hakka. The valley of Al Basra, the ruler of Al Basra. Al Basra is the, you know, we have Baghdad, Al Kufa, Al Basra. These are the main three cities in, 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 Baghdad, in Iraq. Baghdad was the capital of knowledge, of grammar, different Qur'an, and, uh, and fiqh, and hadith, and all oh, ulama, not only al din, but also about dunya, chemistry, and medicine, and so on. Baghdad was the city, in the entire world, especially in terms of our basics. All libraries, public libraries, and uh, schools and universities established there, and, and also uh, hospitals. Europe does not know any of these things. So, to get some approval, to be a recognized scholar, you have to stop by these three cities to meet their scholars. And Basra and Kufa, they have also two schools of thought. In, in Arabic grammar, you study Arabic grammar deep. Then you say this is a method of the Basriyin, they say it this way, and the Kufiyin, they say it that way. So and there is always kind of jealousy between two, and, and competition, I would say, competition between them. Alamak al Basra and Alamak al Kufa. He came to Al Imam, and by the way, he lived in Syria for 19 years, in Tartus, in Syria. He likely there and stayed there, then he went back to Baghdad. And the governor of Al-Basra traveled to Baghdad especially to meet Abu Dawood and to beg him to move to Basra to live there. Obviously, he lived after Imam Ahmad, after Imam Bukhari. So, he, and in his time, he was, he was one of the greatest scholars of Hadith. And the governor of Al-Basra wanted him to come especially because there was a big fit that happened in Basra. And there was a revolution that took place known as Tharat al Zinj, and they revolted against the Abbasids. And after about 15 years or so, Al, -Al Abbasid smashed them, and then the Basra was almost destroyed. So they asked Abu Dawood to come in order to rebuild the city and to, 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 to attract the students of knowledge to come because Abu Dawood is there. Other than that. And when he visited him in his house in Baghdad, told him that I uh, came here for three, I have three requests. And said, what are these three? He said, I want you to move to Basra. Hopefully, people will come and live there. He said, what is the second one? He said, to teach my kids Sudan. <coughs> okay, fine. What is the third one? He said, to have a special meeting for my children. When you teach them, teach them privately. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. The same thing was asked by for Imam Muslim as well, and they used to do oh, Bukhari, sorry. Bukhari, when the governor of Bukhara told him, he said, no, I cannot do that. And these kind of scholars, that's not arrogance. But they and nobody did the same thing. When Harun Rashid himself, Harun Rashid, Harun Rashid was the, perhaps one of the greatest scholars in the in, in, History after the Fatah Rashid, of course, power, authority, and he has some taqwa also. And uh, Abbasid's uh, dynasty was the strongest in his time. Uh, Harun Rashid came all the way to Medina to learn from Malik, not in his house, it's all in the university. He said, because knowledge cannot be uh, uh, what you call privatized. I cannot, he said, I cannot just give knowledge to certain people. No, if all people are equal when it comes to knowledge, 
If you are serious, like, like Salah, you know, come Salah, you pray in the first row, if you come here, come late, you pray wherever you are. Right? That's it. You want to seek knowledge? Come and sit down. I'm not going to make a meeting with the you know, wealthy and one for the business people and one for the rulers and one of the family of the rulers. That, that doesn't work this way. And there's something called al ilmu yukta ilayhi. You want knowledge? Come to the knowledge doesn't come to you. Right? It's not like now people have, you know, Google and all these things just sit and listen and listen. No, it doesn't work this way. You may get some information there, but that, that's not knowledge. So he refused, and the governor actually accepted that, and, and he moved to Al-Basra and lived there for, for so long. Scholars of Hadith, as I said before, there's something called Al-Jarh wa Ta'deef. Al-Jarh wa Ta'deef, hundreds of people in changed generations, right? And they have said that this person, no, cannot accept the Hadith of this person, because he's not good enough, right? And at that time, they have some strange criteria. You know? For example, um, when someone eats in the street, and eats in public in the street, like I said, kind of madness. If he does, if he does not, you know, have a hamama, something, you know, is not good about this person. What especially when it comes to honesty, honesty, that's the, the big, the first thing they look at. Is honesty, lying, breaking promises, making false statements. That's a big thing. That that person cannot be accepted. It doesn't matter whether he is from his tribe, from his family. It doesn't matter. And Abu Dawood said about his son, "Don't take hadith from his son. My son is a liar. Why? Because he lied once or twice. My son is a liar. And kafdab or kafdab is." One of the titles that given to you. La yukhabinu hadith. This person is matruk. Matruk means is 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 abandoned. Nobody would take hadith from him. But sometimes they are very blunt. He right? said kafdab. He is kafdab. And he said my son is kafdab. Son. Because this amana, this ilm, this knowledge is amana, and um, he has to be honest about this. Muhammad ibn Mithlab said Abu Dawood knows very well more than 100,000 hadith and uh, he is at the best of his time. Some actually said that Ibn Abdul Jawzi said about him that he is not only half of an alim but he also knows the hidden things about the hadith. It's called al hadith. And he also has taqwa and waraq. And he does not sell his deen to gain dunya, as many scholars do. And he looks like Imam Ahmad, his teacher. Sometimes students automatically or, or unwillingly, sometimes they look like they're, they act or behave like the teachers. If you, if you go to a teacher for years, learn from him, then automatically you not only take his knowledge, but also you take his behavior and how he speaks, how he walks, and he, his hayya. Okay? Imam al-Dhahabi said about this particular They said Abu Dawood looks like Ahmad fi hadihi wa dallihi wa sabdihi The way he handles himself, the way he walks and talks and sits down to teach and the way he answers questions He looks like Imam Ahmad, his teacher And Ahmad used to look like Waqiyah Waqiyah is the teacher of Imam Shafi Okay and Waqiyah looks like Sufyan, Sufyan al Thawri. Now, getting closer from the Sahara, okay? And Sufyan looks like Mansur, and Mansur looks like Ibrahim, and Ibrahim looks like Al Tama, and Al Tama looks like Abdullah bin Mas'ud. And they said, Al Tama, the student from the Mas'ud, used to say that, and Abdullah bin Mas'ud used to look like the Prophet, and how he behaves. So, <laughs> even you know, the Quran Hadith, so they took all these children of narration, even if how, how they look like, and how they behave, and how they uh, hold themselves. He wrote so many books, uh, many of them are, are, are missed, as, as is the case uh, with uh, many other 
scholars, and he died uh, in the 16th of Shawwal 275. That was one of the golden age of, of fiqh and hadith and badaib and knowledge. And, and unfortunately, after this, the fourth and fifth, all this stopped. And the ummah just repeats and repeats and repeats, and the creativity and this uh, great achievements all of a sudden stopped. With the exception of some scholars here and there. But uh, until now, um, we are just relying on what has been written at that time. When you're saying creativity is lost, what exactly are you talking about? We talk about, think about Harvard. The best students go to Harvard, right? And, and they evaluate these big institutions based on how many research published from these institutions by students, graduate students, PhD students, postgraduate students, professors. How many books and, and, and articles have been published by students and staff of this university? Now, if you look at Harvard, usually number one every year, they have this. Uh, why is that? Because, because this creativity and writing in depth about different subjects, economy, politics, history, all, all, all different uh, uh, disciplines. This is what gives value to an, a, 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 an institution. Muslims at this time, there's no one can compare Muslims to anybody else. Muslims were the top in all these fields because of the production. That, that's what I mean by creativity. Writing, books, articles, innovations. Um, this, this, this kept going down, and now we are way behind. Way behind. The amount of books written in the entire Arab world, for example, is by far less than what the books made in one European country. By far. I can't give you the numbers, but you will be shocked. With all this wealth, all these people, all these minds, and, and this is a level of creativity. This is what reflects actually that how intellectual a community or society is. Public libraries, forget about public. Now Iraq was again was was Harvard of the world. Now Iraq is producing ISIS. Stupid people killing each other for money. So uh, it is something just to reflect. Writings and, and taqlid. Taqlid means that you just you go and memorize this and some of this and then it needs to become alim and faqih. So we don't have enough more Ghazalis, we don't have more Ibn Rushd, we don't have more of Ibn we don't have more of Ibn Hazm, we don't have more of these stars. So just go and fall, taqlid, taqlid, memorize, memorize. It's all about memorization. Memorization is not that difficult, by the way. If you put a, a child in, in, a, in a library or, 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 or in, a, in a school, a closed school, a madrasa, they'll memorize anything you give to them. They have, you know, spot memory. They give you a, a, a memory. But memorization does not make a scholar. Unfortunately, we measure now the scholarship of a person and how much you memorize. Now we have a CD of uh, flash. You can put all these nine books of hadith in one flash drive. You want to find any hadith, just go and you find out this is in Bukhari, and it is in Dimaja, and in Tamidi, and in Darami, and Dar Qutni, and Bayhaqi. All, all, you, will, you will find the hadith in all books of hadith. You can search them by just writing a few words. So, but we did not go beyond this. This is Muhammadin of Sukhaha, a knowledgeable people. They did not imitate and stop with what their teachers did. As we mentioned, Bukhari, Muslim, and with our old student of Ahmed. Ahmed, also the student of, of the Shafi. The Shafi is a student of Mali. But they, they have great respect for scholars, but they add something. They add something. That's creativity and scholarship. Just imitating, memorizing, is not enough. Comments or questions before we conclude? Yes, sir. What was the period when the Tabari was uh, working on, on the Tabari? Well, Tabari was earlier than this, all this. Tabari was, was one of the genius of this Ummah. 
Imam Tabari was a historian, and the first one who wrote book of Tafsir as we understand Tafsir. Tafsir was also including books of Hadith, by the way. Tafsir was not a uh, standalone kind of science, it was including Hadith. Imam Tabari is the one who started this al Hadith Tafsir in Maksur, that he called the ayah and then he says, Oh, I heard Allah so says about this ayah, and so on and so on. And the Abbas said, so on and so on. One ayah after the other, until he finished the surah and then well, from one surah. So, and he is a linguist. His book in, 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 in Tafsir has been summarized like a number of times. He wants to make it much larger than this, but these students cannot keep all this. And I think he was the one that they, they said that you know when, when they sharpen the, the at that time the pens they have to sharpen it and put it in the ink and write. Uh, I think I, I don't know if he's Tabari or New Jersey, one of the two. And they when he died they warm up the water they have to warm up the water with all these uh, the remaining of these uh, shavings. The strip, the, the small piece, they collect it and they, they, they use it to, you know, to make fire, to uh, use it to warm up the water, to wash his body. So these people, they're just sitting, writing, and reading. It's difficult to read everything in our And at that time, writing was very slow, not like the pens we have now, or the uh, typing. No, they have to write it word by word. All these books went. Well, nobody was 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 encyclopedia. However, no, nobody when he died, he actually was in the house arrest. Now you see, these scholars they actually suffer so much. by the governments, the kings. Not only that, by scholars. But of course, you know, Bukhari, you mentioned Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Yahya al his teacher, was so jealous. And then Tabari was in under house arrest by the Hanbalis, the fanatic followers of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. They said his aqidah is fasida, and he said, don't, 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 they prohibit anybody to listen to him. And they did not allow him to go and teach in the Masjid. Stay home. Nobody comes to him. And when he died, his janitor or three people, his janitor, carrying his janitor, put him in his grave. That's what fanaticism. This great scholar, if he was a French or British scholar, he would now without remember. Been honored. What uh, it, fanaticism is is the cancer. Give me one uh, last question. I have noticed like uh, somebody who follows Hanafi during the prayers, they hold their hands like that and Shafai, they do this, um, uh, maybe, maybe they need their hands down and pray. Is this coming from direct Sunna, from Rasulullah, or how did these Imams got these ideas of holding hands together? Or? When it comes to Salah and what to do in Salah in particular, we rely in a hadith. Because Quran does not talk about all these details. And a hadith comes from different Sahaba. Because the Prophet prayed Nafla and Farad so many times in front of them. And at that time, of course, there's no videotaping. Otherwise, we'd have known exactly. So the Sahabi will, will describe in word, in his own words, that I saw the Prophet doing this. Okay? Another Sahabi will describe it perhaps a little different. And you have tons of narrations. If you think this narration is stronger, then follow it. Rafa Yadayn, raising the hands. You know, Hanafis don't do that. And Shafi'is do this. Sami Allah, Ibn Hamidah, Rabbi Allah. You know, Hanifah was told, how come that you are not you know, raising your hands? And the hadith is very authentic from very authentic people. He says, well, this, this is that scholarship. He said, there are two hadith. One hadith says the Prophet raises his hand only in the Good Ihram. Only in the first degree. Allah, Allah. That's it. But the other hadith, all very authentic. Very, all everybody is trustworthy. Now, Hanifa, you know, he died in one 
150. So it was very close from the Sahara. We have to, that's another example of how to reconcile the hadith, how to choose, make reference. Imam Hanifa said, well, this hadith, yeah, for very authentic people, what, if you put this chain of narration next to this chain of narration, he said this person is equal to this person, and this equal to this, and this equal to this, but this person has more fiqh, so I will go with this fiqh. So Abu Hanifa did not say the other narration is weak, or not authentic, or is wrong, or any of these things, but he said now we have to very authentic hadith. To me, I feel, I, I'm inclined more to this because one of these people is, is a faqih. And the other person is also knowledgeable and trustworthy, but this has more fiqh. So I would just go there. That, that, that's where, where, where it came from. <laughs> Very easy. It's a, it's a preference. Right? When you like, you like to go and, and buy two several things, two I mean, phones. Both are good. I mean, but I you know what? I like this little small thing. I'll, I'll go for it. When you buy products, you put like can compare four products, right? Break it down to two. Okay, I will. So which one of the two I done? Both are good for me. You have to choose one. So I don't even choose one. And now, if you you know some ignorant people, if you raise your hand after the poor, what are you doing? That's your make an act out of salah. This your salah will be bottom. I don't so I heard that Imam Munir was praying in the masjid, very fanatic Hanafi, and he was raising his hand. And the guy told him, What are you doing? He said, No, there was, there was a fly. I was just the fly. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to discuss these things with people or even, right? So it's a matter of preference. But this does not mean the other hadith is wrong or the other is not sunnah. It's sunnah, but if you have two conflicting hadith, you have to go with one. But he never said, if you raise your hand, then you saw us about it. This is what people add, what the ignorant people add. This. So you have so many narrations describing what happened. So, so it's a matter of preference. Imam Ahmed says, I prefer it, but to me this is more authentic, or I feel more comfortable with this hadith that says, you start us allow alhamdulillah. Imam Shafi'i said, no, other hadith, Abu Huraira, or the Prophet started with Bismillah, I feel more comfortable with this. For some, not just feel comfortable because I, it's not a matter of feeling, it's a matter of evidence. To me, this hadith, it sounds to me more authentic, so I'll go ahead. So, you know, Shafi, start with Salah, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Little small things that's not really, um, really, you know, necessarily create fitna or, or big fighting. No, 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 you cannot do this, you cannot do that. Just, you are not a scholar, just. Do what you think is good for you, be happy with it. And let people alone, leave you alone. A lot of times we run into arguments these days. Like things like combining the salahs when you're traveling. They say Hanafis should never combine. Yes. Who said that? Hanafi? Hanafis? Hanafis should never combine. Zohar Asar, Padre Bishan. Uh -huh. Like when you're traveling, yes. we do that. And other Mazayans do. I think only Mahanafis don't do it. So there are some people who say, no, 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 no. I said, I am here in America. Wherever I go, if I go to a wedding in Chicago, for example, right? Maghrib time comes, Maghrib Salah happens, then they will make an announcement. Tra brothers traveling, please join us for Isha. And yes. I join it, and I do Isha, and then I do Vitar, and I'm done. Yes. <laughs> said, no, 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 you cannot, you have to wait till it's 11 o'clock because this is summer time. Then you can only do it at the time. Oh. Is it really a problem if someone practices like that? He says, this is, this is bad if you cannot do this. Because yeah. you, you are picking and no, choosing. I mean, Imam Muhammad is not a prophet. But you see, take this as an opportunity to, you know, just widen your knowledge. It's, right. it's beautiful. I, it's, I enjoy it. Why Abu Hanif is like that? What is rationale? What is the need? It's beautiful. I don't do it, but I respect it. Imam Hanifa, because he found out that there are so many hadith, and it is well established that hadith does not give you authority, does not have the authority of the Quran. Does not have the authenticity of the Quran. So the Quran is the source. Quran is the source. 
Sunna, as we said, if it comes and confirms, and that's fine. But now, he, to him, this contradiction. Quran says, pray on time. In the salata kanat alamina, kitaba, mawkuta. Mawkuta means time it. Right? It's not just five salata. Salah comes with time. All right. That's the Quran. Now, you are telling me this hadith says the Prophet combined the prayer. Think about this. Forget about, about who said what, but think about it. If, what, what makes more sense to you? Okay? Let's take this as an exercise. Imam al Hanifa says that Sunnah or the Hadith does not abrogate the Quran. Quran can abrogate the Quran, but the Sunnah does not have the power to authority to abrogate. Abrogation means to cancel a problem and to establish a new problem. Obviously, makes a lot of sense, right? Now, can the Sunnah particularize what is mentioned generally in the Quran? That's the question. Abu says no. Unless, Abu Hanifa says, unless it is mutawatir or mashhur. These are the two. Mutawatir is the highest level of, 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 of authenticity. Mashhur is less than mutawatir, but also accepted. That's more than sahih. That's mutawatir or mashhur. Only mashhur or mutawatir sunnah can give some exceptions to what the Quran says generally. That includes this case. So, Quran says, in the salat kanat alamina kitabat mawkuta. That's general. Can the Sunnah say, okay, but in this case you can do it differently? Abu Hanifa said only if you mutawatir or mashhur. It's less than this? No. What about all the other madhaib? Other madhaib. Other madhaib says, well, if you have a hadith narrated, not a hadith, you have hundreds of hadith. Imam Malik has many, many hadith, not just one or two or three. Many hadith. The Prophet combined Dhuha Nas and he combined Nara bin Shah. And the Sahaba did this after him. In the time of Bakr and Omar. Imam Malik said, of course, the Sunnah comes also from Allah. The Prophet would it. What, what is the meaning of When the Prophet does something, do like him. And he said, pray as you see me pray. Additionally, Quran says, So the Prophet did it. And we have a bunch of hadith. Okay, so the Prophet has the authority to particularize or to give exception to what has been generally mentioned. So Malik and Shafi and Ahmad and so many others in this course. And this actually in line with the easy nature of Sharia. Sharia says that when something gets difficult, Allah makes it easy. وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ يَجَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجُ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ الْعُسْرِ Perfect. So, what do you think? Which of the two thought process do you think it, it, it makes more sense? I would say since this is a practice issue, the, the leniency for making it easy is, is more practical. More practical? And more reasonable. Right. Rather than sticking by, do it on time or else. I what? understand, that's what the Quran says. Right. That your, your salahs have been designed or they have been prescribed at particular times only. But the Prophet is practicing it differently. The Sahaba are practicing it different way. And they're using the lenience that Deen allows you. Right. So if you, if you are an Imam Shah who died in, or was born in 150, uh, and, and died in the early uh, second century. And you have, you, you go, your shape is mad. And you find many authentic hadith. Authentic hadith. They call that the golden chain. You have this golden chain. You know, it comes from these persons, this golden chain. You have many of them in different instances. It's not just one instance, no, many different. The problem traveled so much, right? The Hijra, and then Fatih uh, Makkah, uh, and then Khaybar, Hudaybiya, Umrah, Hajj, Tabuk. It traveled, not once or twice, it traveled so much. 
and the Sahaba traveled so much. Right? So we have a bunch of authentic hadith. Would you say, well, I will take this? Because the Prophet is the one who will teach us what to do. And he did it a number of times. Yes, these all hadith are not as authentic as the Quran, but it's authentic enough to give us confidence the Prophet did it a number of times. So, Imam Shafi'i in his mind that he is very well, um, uh, uh, you know, sure, certain that Prophet did this. And as you said, from practical perspective, it's very difficult to pray on time at all time. If you are sitting, sitting in your city, it, it's understood you can't pray on time, but when you are traveling, when you are sick, when you are taking a long exam, when you are operating on an on, 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 uh, injured person, practically it's impossible. It's impossible. So sometimes you have to combine the prayer, it's a rukhsa given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a matter of the putting the needs in order. So Quran, not, 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 not the Quran, the, the Sunnah, if not the Sunnah, then uh, this Abu Hanifah says, Abu Hanifah says, his methodology says, I'll give that to Bismillah. If it's the Quran, that's it. I'm not going to look at anything else. If not in the Quran, I'll go with the Sunnah of the Prophet. If I don't find the Quran and the Sunnah, I will go with the, I will choose one of the Sahaba's opinions. So if you have an issue, Omar said this, Zayd bin Thabit said that, and then Abbas said this, you have three opinions. He said, I will choose one of them. I'm not going to get out of these three opinions. I will have to choose one of them. What I feel comfortable with. Then after the Sahaba, with all due respect to all these scholars who came before me, they made their own mind, I will make my own jihad. So Quran, Sunnah, opinion of the Sahaba, then my own Okay? <coughs> so again, so I would say, yes, but the ideas now, you are Hanafi. You cannot do it because Hanafi can who said you are Hanafi? Yeah, this is what is that? I mean no, if you're no. Hanafi, you can't be I don't understand. It it it, it, it is abs it's a big myth. <laughs> you are not Hanafi. Okay? You, because you pray in a community that happened to be led by Hanafi, that does not make you Hanafi. Growing up in my household, my mother was Shafi. Okay. And she used to do this okay. every time. Right. And my father was Hanafi. So we saw both in, in my own house. In, in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my mother used to say, don't do like I do. She follow your father. Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> Not in trouble, but. She is so merciful. <laughs> yeah. no, I'm just kidding. Well, well again. Again, this idea, if you're Hanafi, you must say Hanafi, it's stuck. It, it is a competition between Madah. It's a competition. Like, you know, it, it's a competition. People want more customers to be uh, ruled by them. It, that's what it is. Al-Ammi la bala bala. Al-Ammi la bala. You have no matter. The best majority of Muslims don't even know what Madah is. I assure you. If you ask the, not, the mass majority of Muslims in the Middle East or in, in India, or, What's your matter? The mass majority of them say, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't know. Or they claim something, but they know nothing about it anyway. They don't know nothing. But, but prayer and fasting, that is not still only. You have mu'amalat, you have tons of other things. Okay. Yeah. So I always tell people, if you are born in, 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 and raised in Morocco, you'll be praying like Malik, according to Malik, because you are grown up in this community. You grow up in, in Indonesia or Malaysia, you will do things according yeah. to Shafi'i. You grow up in Saudi Arabia, you will do things. If you get a contract, move to Saudi Arabia, we'll be praying like Saudi. You're not going to all not die. No, Isha time. We'll have to wait for 18 degrees of all these nonsense. When the Isha is called in Mecca or Medina, you pray Isha. It is an hour and a half after Maghrib. We'll establish ruling. Maghrib is 5 o'clock. 6.30 they shall pray it. That's it. And you'll hear the Mu'addin go and pray with the Jama'ah. That's it. You're not a scholar. You just follow the Imams of the local community. And these fatwas that come from Egypt or Saudi, how do we trust these fatwas? I mean, I don't know. Are they restricted? Well, you have to do your homework. Look at the rationale and ask the experts. 
and they will tell you, okay, this patois, I think, is, is related to this local community, but does not fit us here. Does not fit us here. Uh, the the fact is that Muslims must be buried in the Muslim cemetery. Yes, that's well established truth. But here in America, most of Muslim community don't have their own cemetery. What should we do? They wrote to the Saudi uh, Imam, someone from America here. They told him that we don't have a Muslim cemetery. So what did you do? He said, no, it's prohibited. Muslims must go. The guy said, we don't have a cemetery. Now we have a section for Muslims, both sections. He said, no, we cannot do that. And the man said, so what should we do? And this car said, that, uh, bury him in the desert. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a big crime. It's a crime. If you go and hide bury someone in the desert of Nevada, you're in big trouble. You cannot do that. And because this shape did not leave Saudi Arabia and they had plenty of desert there, he thinks the whole world is like Thank you, Zakabah, otherwise I'll be in prison. Thank <laughs> you.